Well, funeral services for former Fort Myers City Councilwoman Dr. Ann Knight will be held this weekend. Dr. Knight died last week at the age of 89. Now, there will be a visitation tomorrow from 4 to 7 at the Trinity Church in Fort Myers. Her funeral will be held Saturday at Gulf Coast Church of Christ in Fort Myers starting at 11 in the morning. Dr. Knight is a former educator and served War 3 on City Council for more than 20 years. That name might sound familiar to you. The Stars Complex was renamed in 2016 in her honor. And City Councilman Johnny Streets tells us she paved the way for many in our community. Well, with changes to our state's unemployment requirements, we want to make sure we help get you answers about that new work search requirement. Anyone receiving unemployment benefits must prove that they are actively looking for work. So if you live in Lee, Collier or Charlotte counties, five work searches are required. Now for those in Hendry and Glades, just three searches will do. Now, if you are offered a job you are not ready to take, Career Source tells us they will try to relate to your particular concern. It could be various reasons as to why you did not accept the job. And what I've been hearing from some of our job, job seekers is that they may not give you the full 40 hours a week you need. They may not give you the minimum you need for a livable wage. So at that point, then we go ahead and sit down with you and talk to you and how you can go ahead and place a claim on your benefits payment, uh, on your benefits um, services so you don't go ahead and lose that particular week uh, payment of benefits. Now, Career Source of Southwest Florida also wants you to know there are some hiring events on the way if you're looking for a job. For more information, you can head to fox4now.com slash rebound. Unemployment numbers are down for a fifth week in a row. New weekly jobless claims are down to around 385,000. That's the first time they dropped below 400,000 since the start of the pandemic. But ongoing claims did rise slightly, putting the total number of people receiving assistance at almost 3.8 million. Job opportunity continues to pick up. Private companies added more jobs last month than they had in a year when the country first started to reopen. It's nearly 1 million new jobs according to payroll company ADP. Leisure and hospitality jobs added the most positions. Now lawmakers are tossing out plenty of ideas to fill jobs. Proposals include providing federal dollars to local workforce groups to do job training and placement for people out of work six months or longer. Another idea would allow states to use federal unemployment money to offer one-time bonuses to people who get off uh, benefits and get a job. Now those payments could be between six and $1,200. Other ideas include expanding a tax credit for companies that hire disadvantaged workers. But when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, um, it was a shock to me because I felt like um, I was a superhero. <laughs> Myel Bauer Smith spent her life as an athlete, a service member, and now a breast cancer survivor. For years leading up to her diagnosis, she had been a blood donor, but it wasn't until someone else's donation saved her own life that she realized the impact it had. I wasn't clotting. I wasn't blood. My blood wasn't clotting. So that, that if I, my blood don't clot, that means I'm going to continue to bleed. So that saved my life. The American Red Cross says cancer patients use the most blood donations than patients with any other disease. About six blood products are needed every minute. Platelets are especially important, like myel needed. Now they're the key clotting factor in blood and only have a shelf life for five days. Now the Red Cross is concerned about its supply as hurricane season gets underway. Without donations now, it will be difficult to get blood to people in any hard hit areas. So I just, I encourage everybody just to donate a little, go give a, a pint, you know, because it will save someone's life. It saved mine. The Red Cross is offering a few incentives this month to give blood, things like free t-shirts and Amazon gift cards. Now, dozens of hospitals have been forced to close during the pandemic and more could still have to. We were hit earlier, we were hit harder, and we were hit longer by COVID. The repayments that hospitals are having to make now and the additional help they say could turn things around. Looking for a turnaround here, the much needed rain resulting in serious problems for some local business owners after they say that downpour brought even more damage to their locations. We're working to find out who's responsible for the repairs next on Fox 4 News at 5. 
Hospitals across the country are bleeding cash because of the pandemic. Last year alone, 47 hospitals were forced to close. It's left communities struggling to find access to emergency care. Chris Conti takes a closer look at what's happening and the help that hospitals say they need to survive. A global pandemic has not done any favors for hospitals across America. Lifelines for countless communities and many are now on life support. We were hit earlier. We were hit harder and we were hit longer by COVID. Deborah Wilson is the CEO of Lawrence General Hospital, a hospital which in 2021 is expected to lose about $20 million. We need to actually make sure that institutions are available to be impactful. With those kinds of losses, the hospital is being forced to implement $6 million in cuts. 57 nurses, doctors and staff are being let go but they are far from the only hospital left in financial distress because of the pandemic. Before COVID, we, we had a weak balance sheet. So what's happening? Many hospitals are being asked to repay emergency Medicaid reimbursements they were granted during COVID. There are also been delays in dispersing COVID-19 relief money. By some estimates, hospitals could still be looking at $53 billion in revenue loss for 2021, 27 billion of that from outpatient care, 17 billion from inpatient care, and about $9 billion from emergency room visits being down. The emergency room is sort of their front door, and a lot of revenue comes in through the emergency room. Ken Kaufman is an industry expert. While the pandemic appears to be winding down, many hospitals still aren't seeing the volumes of patients they need to stem their financial bleeding. We've had a very uneven recovery in, in, in the hospital world. <laughs> Hospitals are also being squeezed in other ways. Labor costs are up 14%. Supply costs are up 13%. Drug expenses up 17%. Are we still going to lose some more hospitals because of this? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. 47 hospitals across the country closed or filed for bankruptcy last year. It's patients and communities who are ultimately hurt the most when that happens. We are necessary for this community. This is a matter of life and death. Hospitals like Lawrence General are once again asking the federal government to step in and provide some kind of help. If you ever told me that we would not have received any relief, any relief since July of last year, I would have thought that that was inconceivable. Until then though, the financial health of many of this nation's hospitals will remain uncertain. I'm Chris Conti. Chris, thank you. And discouraging results so far for venues trying to get financial help from the government. New numbers provided to our Scripps National Investigative Team from the Small Business Administration show only 31 venues have received grants so far. That's out of more than 13,000 applications. The average grant awarded was over $1 million. Congress allocated $15 billion for venues back in December. The SBA says it has taken time to develop a system to screen applicants to protect against waste and fraud. As Derek and Cindy have been showing us here in Fox 4 News at 5, we saw record rainfall on Wednesday. And for some business owners, those heavy downpours impacting their bottom line. Take a look. Brian Waldron of Florida Security Firearms and Training says all that rain led to this damage in his unit. He tells Fox 4 for him and other tenants at this plaza right off of Pondella Road in North Fort Myers, they've reported these conditions, including mold, to the building owner. So he's looking to take his business elsewhere, but that right now is a challenge too. I'm looking for another place, but with the way it is right now, rent so expensive, um, it's been very hard to do that. Now coming up on Fox 4 News at 6, I'll show you the extent of this damage and the response from a company overlooking the roofing project. Let's take you outside right now. This is our breaking news tracker driving around Fort Myers and you can see right now there's a little bit of a buildup on the roads and of course one thing that you can notice is those roads are wet Southwest Florida. So if you plan on heading out just a heads up from not only our photographer driving in our breaking news tracker right now but also from our weather team meteorologist Cindy Presler here 
checking out those rain totals and what are you seeing Cindy? We had some pretty good totals again today not like yesterday but this all helps that rainfall deficit which we had drought conditions still exist especially across Collier County but we're breaking it down little by little. Cape Coral today half an inch look at that Estero picked up almost one and a half inches and Golden Gate Estates 2.2 2.02 inches today so it really depends on where you're located. These little showers moving slowly again today so they're starting to die off this evening. The daytime heating is now backing off. We didn't get quite as warm today as we did yesterday. We still have some rain now right along I-75 and that's really been the focus again. Up toward Bonita Springs north in Naples. We've got some rain there. Also in Hendry and Glades County. Clewiston picking up some more rain. These little showers will be making their way up toward Lake Okeechobee and another little shower there around Boquilia picking up some nice rain. Northern Pine Island that's making its way to the north as well into Charlotte County. So for this evening these will start backing off. We still have a chance for some showers from Lee County north northward later this evening. So you, if you didn't get any rain, you still have a shot. Little bump there. And then tomorrow again, we'll have scattered showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon. Same thing again as we head into the weekend because this flow just continues. Ridge of high pressure out in the Atlantic. We get that surface flow out of the east southeast, pulling in tons of moisture. The atmosphere is so efficient right now, just wringing that out. It's just like a dish rag. Just twist it and wring it out. So for the next two days, we're going to see a lot of rain again. So if you didn't get any, yes, still have a good chance. So for this evening, few scattered showers and storms yet. 6 p.m., 7 p.m. temperatures in the lower 80s. By 8 o'clock, we should have mostly cloudy skies and overnight becoming partly cloudy. Already you saw the sun just peeking through. Temperatures dropping into the 70s, extremely sticky and muggy. We'll take a look at that weekend and also more on the upcoming showers and storms heading into next week. Coming up on Fox 4 News at 5, a suspect is now in custody in connection to that Memorial Day shooting on Fort Myers Beach, where police found him and the charges that he's facing. Coming up next on Fox 4 News at 5. News. A suspect connected to that Memorial Day shooting on Fort Myers Beach is now behind bars. This morning, 18-year-old Jatavion Craig was arrested in Alabama. The Lee County Sheriff's deputies are there to bring him back to Southwest Florida. Craig is facing multiple charges, including aggravated assault with a firearm. And we are learning more details about just what happened in a road rage incident in Cape Coral yesterday. Police say the suspect and victim exchanged some type of words and fingers, and then the suspect threw a protein shake, which hit the passenger in the eye. One former police chief says when tensions run high, don't get caught up in the moment. I don't recommend keeping him up with that driver because he's just uh, going to perceive that as a continued threat, and it's just going to escalate from there. Now, once they stop, the suspect is accused of trying to pull the driver and passenger out of the vehicle. The driver and passenger did get out of the car and they started hitting the suspect. Allegedly, Christopher Velez is facing multiple assault charges. Chris. We currently have a safety system that rates cars by how well they protect you when you're inside the vehicle. One bill would create the first of its kind rating system in the United States for how safe cars are for someone walking or riding their bike next to them. A lawmaker in New York's proposing this. If it happens, transportation safety experts say it could put pressure on car makers to provide this information in more places. Now, this bill is bringing particular attention to SUVs. Data from the National Highway Safety Administration shows that SUVs are associated with an increase in pedestrian deaths from 2008 to 2018. Transportation safety experts say the larger car means more force. Also, the angle of impact and how that impact is distributed with the taller car makes them more deadly. It's not necessarily going to be able to go to the point that it can say how uh, how deadly it is, but much more on the reverse. What is the level of protection that it can provide? Offer Grenbeck is with the Safe Transportation Research and Education Center at UC Berkeley. He thinks the rating system proposed in New York could be a good first step. It's good to try and encourage road users to be aware of uh, uh, the responsibility that they're carrying. It's good to encourage road users to be safe. But at the end of the day, we also want to make uh, a system that has redundancy in it um, because uh, uh, people do make mistakes. And when that happens, you do not want it to cost your life or someone else's life. 
He says Europe has these pedestrian safety regulations for cars to some extent, but what's happening in the United States so far has been voluntary. The U.S. Government Accountability Office found last year about 60% of model year 2019 cars in the U.S. had pedestrian crash avoidance technology. The National Highway Traffic, Traffic Safety Administration proposed having tests for new cars on pedestrian safety back in 2015, but so far the agency hasn't made a decision on how to move forward. Now we found the same big name companies who came out against racial injustice are now selling souvenir coins depicting police misconduct. How they're responding after we confronted them about this. Is your job requiring the COVID-19 vaccine? What happens if you have some type of reaction to it? Are they responsible? Leslie Delisbor joins us next with an answer right here on Fox 4 News at 5. Live from the station that's in your corner, you're watching Fox 4 News at 5. And thanks for joining us for Fox 4 News at 530. I'm Shari Armstrong, and we're glad you're here with us. Some companies are now requiring employees to get the COVID-19 vaccine before returning to work. And if for some reason you have like an adverse effect, you might not be able to take legal action. Fox 4's Leslie Dallas spoke to one employee's rights attorney who says there's not much that the average person can do in that situation. Leslie. Ryan Barrick says if you plan on filing a workers comp claim against your employer after you were required to get the COVID-19 vaccine, you won't get very far. It's not a strong case, Barrick says, if you plan on filing a workers comp claim against your employer after they required you to get the COVID-19 vaccine and you suffered adverse effects. Barrick says the Florida legislator recently passed a broad immunity law, which means it's difficult to sue someone for any COVID related issue. However, there are certain limitations and exceptions that employers have to adhere to, according to the American with Disabilities Act. But overall, it's almost a waste of time. Uh, in the workers' compensation context, it would be difficult to bring a claim because the Florida workers' compensation system makes it very difficult as a general matter for employees to bring claims. So you have the dual burdens of a workers' compensation system that is very hard on employees. And outside of the workers' compensation, you have a broad immunity for employers. At six, you'll hear more from Barrick about your rights as an employee when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine. In downtown Fort Myers, Leslie Delaspor, Fox 4 News. Leslie, thank you. And staying on top of our vaccine coverage this evening, the White House releasing a new plan on how it will share COVID-19 vaccines with underserved areas. Now, the United States allocated 80 million vaccines to be distributed by the end of the month. Three quarters will go to COVAX, the global vaccine sharing program. The other 25% will be for emergencies and for the United States to share with its allies and partners directly. The first 25 million doses are spread out all over the world from Africa to Asia. The rest involve regional partners, including Canada and Mexico, and to partners primarily in the Middle East. Now, for more on vaccinations, you can head to our website, fox4now.com slash coronavirus. Chris. The White House is calling on companies to step up threat protection of ransomware attacks. In a rare open letter, the National Security Council said corporate executives need to take this type of crime seriously and assess their risk. It's encouraging all companies to follow recommendations recently laid out by the White House on cybersecurity. The letter follows cyber attacks on the Colonial Pipeline and meet supplier JBS. A year ago, companies were making statements against racial injustice and police brutality after the killing of George Floyd. Now, national investigative reporter Patrick Terpstra found some of those same businesses are selling keepsakes commemorating police misconduct. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Amid protests after the killing of George Floyd, major American companies quickly promised to join the fight for change. Let's get to work. A year later, we found four of these same well-known brands allowing the sale of souvenir coins from third-party sellers that depict scenes of police misconduct. Take a look at this challenge coin. For generations, challenge coins have been used and traded as small collectible tokens of appreciation or reward. These unofficial challenge coins we found for sale on some of the largest online marketplaces are different. What we're talking about here are 
these challenge coins that commemorate and really celebrate some problematic aspects of policing. Amazon called for a stop to the brutal treatment of black people in our country. Yet the retailer was selling a coin memorializing this viral video of a traffic stop in Virginia. I'm giving you to the count of three. On the coin, he's carved on the head side with his profane quotes on the rim. Amazon's listing for the keepsake disappeared after we asked about it. But you can still buy another coin we found on Amazon, one that depicts the time. Mind your business. A short fuse Connecticut trooper cussed out a driver he pulled over. How's that sound? Next, Etsy. After Floyd's murder, Etsy took a stand against police brutality in all forms. But Etsy was also selling the coin with a Connecticut trooper and the one with the ex-Virginia trooper. Etsy's listing for the coin vanished when we reached out to ask, why sell these? Neither Amazon nor Etsy ever responded to that question. Now to eBay. Last year, an eBay senior VP wrote, there is no place for hate or violence in our community, and we will do whatever we can to affect change. But eBay recently allowed the sale of a coin commemorating riot team's response to unrest in 2015 with the words, the Baltimore Six, apparently a reference to the six officers involved in the arrest of Freddie Gray, who died in police custody. It just sold on eBay for $300. $166. eBay declined to talk to us about it. I'm not thrilled that retailers are fulfilling this market demand, but I am far more concerned that there is a market demand for this. Lastly, Walmart. We found Walmart's marketplace site also offering the coin with a Connecticut officer. When we asked about it, Walmart took it offline. A spokeswoman saying it was inappropriate. We do have a robust set of processes and rules in place to prevent content like this from being on our site, she wrote. But every so often, something makes it through. Lewis Gregory runs LEO Challenge Coins, where you can buy coins directly. He tells us he's the one who designed the Virginia and Connecticut coins we found on major retail sites. He says they're pop art, a form of expression, not meant to celebrate anything, but to instead mark a moment in time. He wouldn't disclose how many police misconduct coins he has sold or who's buying them. I'm Patrick Terpstra reporting in Washington. All right, Patrick, thank you. Now, LGBTQ youth say the pandemic has made their living situations more stressful and they're feeling the impact on their mental health. We are at risk for a lot of negative health outcomes. That's just a fact, but that's not because of our queerness. It's because of society's response to our queerness, right? The help her group is finding that is making a difference for these youth. All this rain, the reminder that flooding can occur. And coming up on Fox 4 News at 5, a close look at the changes FEMA is making to flood insurance. Plus, are you up for the challenge? The governor says he could use your help in getting one species under control. That's one right here. How you can get involved if you're interested next on Fox 4 News at 5. No thing. He needs. Governor Ron DeSantis is taking extra steps to protect the Everglades by trying to get rid of those Burmese pythons. So you can participate because you can now register for the Python Challenge, which will last from July 9th to the 18th. The goal here is to remove as many of this invasive species from Florida lands as possible, and you can get a prize if you remove the most or the longest python. For more information and where you can sign up, you can visit fox4now.com. I can barely look at that if I'm being honest with you, Southwest Florida. FEMA is making some changes when it comes to flood insurance. We will have a look at how much more you might need to pay coming up next. Cindy. More rain again today. It's taking a bite out of this drought situation. How long is this going to last? I'll have the answer, so don't you go away. It's the start of hurricane season seems to be walking hand in hand with the showers we're starting to see here in southwest Florida. Fox 4's Colton Chavez is taking a look at the flood risk in our area and what you need to know about insuring your home. Colton. Just 24 hours after some pretty heavy rain was pounding the pavement here off Colonial Boulevard in Fort Myers, you can see ponds and pools of water still 
all across this campus. And the reason for that is because of that heavy rain that we saw. Now, there is no secret that we can see a lot of rain in southwest Florida. And at Fox 4, we want to make sure you're protected and up to date on the latest changes from FEMA on your flood insurance. This week, rain seen pouring down off Fowler Street in downtown Fort Myers. The quick change in weather comes as FEMA is now rolling out new changes for their flood insurance. FEMA's new program is called Risk Rating 2.0. Basically, it reevaluates how flood risk is determined based on where you live. Under the new plan, the closer you live to water, guess what? The higher your insurance rate will be. A big deal for a lot of people. Estimates right now say nearly 3.8 million homeowners could now be paying more for flood insurance. FEMA says the new rule cannot hike customers' rate more than 18%, but people who actually live further away from flood zones could see their insurance costs go down. A good thing since one storm surge expert says people living inland should not shy away from purchasing coverage. But one of the downsides is you have to carry flood insurance. So if you don't have flood insurance, you know, I carry it. Uh, and I live in Western Broward. I mean, it takes me in traffic an hour to get to the beach. Okay. Uh, so it, clearly I'm not a coastal resident, yet I still carry flood insurance for the inland freshwater uh, flooding. So now we want to break down what is your risk of flooding? We're going to dial in on the Fort Myers area. This is a map provided by Lee County that breaks down which areas in Fort Myers could see flooding. Now, most of the eastern section of Fort Myers that's in the gray area, which FEMA says is actually very unlikely to flood, less than 1% chance. But areas in pink, like looking down near Fort Myers Beach at the bottom of your screen and up north in the eastern section of Fort Myers, people living along Pine Island Road, FEMA says those areas have a higher probability of flooding. And for a full list of all of these resources, you can go to our website at fox4now.com. In Fort Myers, I'm Colton Chavez, Fox 4. Colton, thank you so much. In Southwest Florida, I want to give you this look outside right now. With all of this talk of rain and flooding, just look how beautiful it is right now. This video is coming to you courtesy of our breaking news tracker driving along Corkscrew Road towards State Road 82. And you can see, obviously, there was some rain there previously. You can see the remnants of that on the road. But right now, it is a beautiful afternoon in that area, which is on the Collier County, Lee County line. But I want to show you this video behind meteorologist Cindy Presler, where it, it didn't look the same this morning. To me. <laughs> this is from uh, it must have been around 1:30, 1 o'clock this afternoon. This is east of I-75 around the Fort Myers area. Heavy rain was falling there. Grass is loving it. I can see little smiles on all that those grass little little seedlings there. They're loving this. The plants are loving it. Everything is good. Got to have this kind of rain and it's doing so and doing it just beautifully across the area. So we're very, very happy to see that. Rainy season difference, look at that. May, we only had four hundredths of an inch. Then June comes along and look at the difference. 4.9 inches of rain that made a huge difference in our deficit for the year. We almost wiped out our deficit. As a matter of fact, we are now a quarter of an inch below average. That's for the entire year so far. But yet, even with all that rain, this is kind of surprising for Collier County, Hendry County, still considered to be a moderate drought. And this came out today. This is the drought uh, monitor. So we still have abnormally dry conditions north of that. So I think by next week, we'll start to see this catch up. After all this rain that we're receiving every day, things are looking better and better. These little showers are dying off now. So for this evening, we don't have the daytime heating going on anymore. So just a little shower just south of Golden Gate along I-75. Most of these are moving to the north at about 20 miles per hour. A little faster pace than we saw yesterday. Now south of Fort Myers on I-75, that shower is just about gone. We still have a few out here in Henry and Glades County near Lake Okeechobee. They're also moving to the north. And a little spot up here in uh, Charlotte County now picking up some light rain coming through the Port Charlotte area. Those little showers are going to be dying off as well. We did see some pretty hefty amounts. This is according to our computer modeling. Three point eight inches near Immokalee, 2.4 near I-75 uh, in Collier County. So again, Collier County was getting the heaviest rain today. This is a water vapor loop. You can see the flow coming in from the northwest, at least aloft, but it's an east-southeasterly flow at the surface, so it kind of pushed the tops of those showers and storms off to the south and east. So we did get some nice rain, and that certainly is great for this evening. We still have a, a chance to pick up a few showers. Temperatures will kind of bounce back into the lower 80s, then drop into the 70s, but it's the humidity. What a huge difference today. Just as sticky as it could be, and with all this atmospheric moisture available, it's going to stay that way until we get into next week, and then that uh, 
a high pressure ridge is going to kind of move to the north and that'll bring a little bit drier air across southwest Florida. But we'll still have a chance for showers and thunderstorms. No, no zero chance here whatsoever. So tomorrow's forecast will bring more showers and storms, temperatures in the 80s. That'll continue into the weekend. The training is unique for some dogs who will be eventually matched with a wounded veteran. Maya Rodriguez shows us how veterans are playing a role in getting the dogs ready for others like them nationwide. See. Meet Dole. Sit. A service dog in training. Stand. Still getting schooled. Well, he's a little bit of a goof, which is probably why they matched him with me. All right, Ham. Dole's trainer, retired Air Force Colonel John Brick. I started out launching nuclear missiles in North Dakota. Uh, I ended up uh, a few years later launching space shuttles in 